Okay, hello everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry we are like 10 minutes late or something because we had some technical issues. Uh, but anyway, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Diogo Pinheiro. I'm a professor of linguistics at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And this is a series on linguistics uh, with an initiative of the linguistics graduate program of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So today we have the honor to receive Dr. Vittorio Tantucci, who is a lecturer in linguistics at Lancaster University in the UK. In fact, I met Vittorio for the first time uh, during my Cognitive Linguistics Conference in Lancaster back in 2014. Uh, and I remember having attended that session where he presented an analysis of one particular construction, an English construction, uh, which he referred to at the time as the, um, as the you don't want X construction. Uh, as in, for example, after fasting so long, you don't want to eat so much at first. This is a real example from Victoria's work. Uh, and he deemed uh, this construction as both idiomatic and intersubjective. And, and his analysis definitely caught my attention uh, at the time for a number uh, of different reasons. First, uh, because the idiomatic and intersubjective nature of the construction is not that self-evident. So you have to take a rather close look at the construction in order to notice it. Uh, second, because I was then starting to become aware myself of a number of similar intersubjective and idiomatic constructions in Brazilian Portuguese. And, and third, and most importantly, uh, because he then presented what struck me as a very promising way of approaching uh, intersubjectivity and intersubjectification uh, it was an approach that fundamentally consisted in posting two different levels of analysis uh, for subjectification and intersubjectivity. Well, but that was like seven years ago in 2014. Uh, Vittorio, of course, went on with this line of research for many, many years. And in fact, this research uh, eventually gave rise to his first book, uh, which I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, will be published by Cambridge University Press very, very soon, if I'm not wrong. Uh, in fact, publication is planned to come, is planned for, for, for this month, uh, April 2021. So um, the, the title of this book is um, Language and Social Minds, The Semantics and Pragmatics of Intersubjectivity which is precisely the title of today's talk. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to thank the audience for being here, and I'd like to thank and to welcome Dr. Vittorio Tantucci. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Diogo. Uh, it's a pleasure to, it's been a pleasure to be in touch with you after uh, so many years uh, when we first met in Lancaster uh, during that conference. And, um, and yeah, like uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad uh, to to be able to to present the contents uh, of my book uh, for you guys. Thank you so much for inviting me and having me. And uh, without further um, uh, chit chat, I will just like share my screen and 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 get on with this if if that's okay with you. Perfect. All right. Let's see if this if this works as we all hope it will yeah should be fine can you can you see my screen yes yes all right okay mm. so this is the cover of the book that um should be out any days um it was supposed to be published by the end of march uh, so uh, i think uh, it's a matter of weeks now uh, the title is, as Diogo was mentioning, Language and Social Minds, the Semantics and Pragmatics of Intersubjectivity. So, I will uh, touch upon uh, four main points in my presentation here, uh, underpinning the, 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 the theoretical uh, assumptions and claims of this book, perhaps a bit of a case study. So we'll talk about theory of mind in cognitive psychology and intersubjectivity in linguistics very briefly. I will introduce the model that I uh, established for this book that is about intersubjective gradients in language and cognition. 
And then I will uh, discuss uh, the immediate and extended intersubjectification uh, of a few constructions in language change and in first language acquisition. And then I will formulate the conclusions of this book. Okay, to start with, as a bit of a preface, what is this book about? This book is about the semantics and pragmatics of social cognition as a gradient dimension of human interaction. What does this mean? It means that our, as, as speakers of a language, our awareness of society uh, is, is gradient, forms a continuum. A continuum. Uh, it varies in complexity, right? Uh, social awareness and the very idea that we are talking as members of a social group is expressed to different degrees as a constitutive element of our linguistic acts. What does it mean? It means that when we talk, the semantics of our expressions very often underpins not just what we are saying at the propositional level, so the words that we use, but also it, it, it very often also includes an ex, a, a, a social meaning, an extended intersubjective meaning. And we will see how does this work. So simply put, the notion of being a member, so social membership, being a member of a social group is a schematic concept, an abstract concept that defines semantic, pragmatic, and even grammatical structure of many linguistic utterances, even the most conventional ones. So as Diogo was mentioning prior, before, consider the construction subject, negative, want verb, X construction. So when we say, I don't want to, you don't want to, whatever it is, especially in English. Uh, to which we, we can, we can uh, attach an, an idiomatic component. So consider, for instance, example number one, I don't want to go to London next week, I'm too busy. In this case, I am quite uh, straightforwardly expressing the literal meaning of um, the volitional uh, dimension of want, right? I'm simply saying what I want or what I don't want. Consider that in the second case that we met, for instance, uh, on a train, uh, perhaps in a COVID-free world, and uh, and, I will, and we will start and we will start talking about London, right? And at some point, uh, you might say, ah, I might consider the idea of, of going to live in London. And, I, and at, which point, at which point I might say, you don't want to go to London; it's too chaotic. I would be able to utter this sentence in English even if I didn't know you, even if you were a stranger, right? So idiomatically would express my understanding of your wants, of what is uh, of your volitional condition, even if I didn't know you. And the reason why is because the I don't want construction or you don't want construction, the subject negative want X construction, in English, underwent extended intersubjectification. What does this mean? It means that I am making a statement that I expect everyone in society would support. It's expre it expresses a social meaning. It expresses the fact that not just uh, you, but no one else would want to go to London. This is almost a common sense assertion. This proposition underpins social recognition, collective recognition, right? It will be the same as saying no one wants to go to London, it's too chaotic. Um, and this is like, this, the, the, this, despite the same surface of one and two, we can see how a new polysemy is attached to the construction that is inherently based on a social and collective meaning and dimension. Um, well, this basically says what I just said. Interesting, the second person pronoun you here in their p underpins a generic social persona's emotions and beliefs. And what is really interesting is that this is not uh, specific to English. Uh, in most languages in the world, the pronoun you means both you and everyone. Uh, acquires through time, uh, through a process of semasiological change, uh, a collective, a social uh, dimension, an impersonal uh, dimension. And, uh, and the fact that this applies to all languages in the world, and this applies not just to the pronoun you, but as we will see to most of the constructions in the languages, 
really indicates that there is some sort of a continuum from our awareness of a specific persona we are talking with to our awareness of society as a whole, as a, as a community of speakers, community of practice, if you want, although uh, maybe this terminology might be uh, problematic for some people. So why do the same linguistic forms sometimes refer to a specific interlocutor? And in some other case, the same form refer refers to society as a whole. These are the questions that actually really drove the writing of this book and the number of, of publications throughout these years that I devoted to intersubjectivity. Again, how can you, the pronoun you, can express both you and anyone in most world languages? What I will be proposing is that there is a semantic and pragmatic gradient from the awareness of emotions and beliefs of a specific interlocutor to the, our ability to uh, empathize to a generic social persona, make reference to culturally established conventions. There is a continuum ranging in complexity. So this continuum uh, runs from linguistic acts that are exclusively aimed at achieving something that is beneficial to us as speakers. And these are the type of linguistic acts that we utter when we are very little, when we are less than four year old, when we have a sort of an egocentric view of the world where language corresponds to propositional meaning. Uh, I want the milk, give me the book, Today, the day is blue and stuff like that, where language is just propositional. And then we have a further stage of intersubjectification where linguistic acts are markedly expressed, the speaker's concern for how the interlocutor may react as a result of what is being, say, being said. In this case, at this level of complexity, we are concerned with the emotions Emo em 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 and the feelings and the viewpoint of a specific mind, of a specific interlocutor. And then there is a further stage of intersubjective complexity underpinning linguistic acts that express a social meaning and a more extended form of intersubjectivity. And therefore the speaker's concern of how anyone in society, in his view, of course, and especially in the society where he grew up, uh, will react as a result of what is being said. So clearly extended in subjectivity is a culture specific form of uh, construing. It, it construes some sort of like social normality that we all based our assertions and statements upon, which clearly varies uh, cross-culturally. So intersubjectivity uh, in linguistics um, is uh, comparable to what intersubject uh, theory of mind um, um, corresponds to in cognitive psychology. Uh, it is also defined as common sense psychology, naive psychology, folk psychology, mind reading and mentalizing, and underpins the cognitive ability to attribute mental states to self and others. So this sort of like the idea, the idea of theory of mind, it doesn't mean that we read each other's minds. It means that we make attempts to do so. It's the cognitive ability to try to empathize, to try to make overt attempts to understand what is going on in our interlocutors or peers' minds. How might they feel or as a react, as a, re, as a result of what is going on? which might be different from what we feel. Impaired abilities to rely on this cognitive mechanism may provide, uh, as, been, as it has been discussed, uh, ev explanatory evidence for developmental disorders such as schizophrenia, but especially uh, autism. In, the case, in autistic subjects, there is, it is argued to be that there is an impeded theory of mind ability. So here we have uh, um, a brief video, a brief excerpt about the so-called very famous Salian test, which is a test that is the designed in order to experimentally assess whether a child is able to view a situation and to conceive a situation from a, from the, a viewpoint 
that differs from his own. In this case, uh, the child that will appear in this video is, is indeed autistic um, and, uh, and might be struggling to pass this particular test. But let's see how does this work. Okay, this is Sally and this is Anne. Which one's Sally? This one, well done, right. And Sally has got a basket. And Anne has got a box, nothing in it. And Sally has got a marble. And Sally puts her marble into her basket to keep it safe while she goes outside to play. But while Sally's outside, naughty Anne moves the marble from Sally's basket into her box. Naughty Anne. So where's the marble now? Box. Good. Where did Sally put the marble in the beginning? Um, basket. In the basket. Well done. So when Sally comes back from playtime, where will she look for her marble? In the box. In the box. All right. As you can see, um, our kid didn't pass the test. So basically, what he looked for, um, he he didn't try to mentalize with um, with Sally. <laughs> he didn't try to mentalize with the the, the the doll, the person who left the room. The person who left the room wouldn't know the fact that the position um, of the object that she would be looking for changed place, right? So he answered from his perspective, but not, but not from the perspective of the doll who left, uh, um, who left the space there, basically. So again, here we can see an egocentric uh, um, view of, of what is going on and the cognitive impairment, the inability to mentalize and to view the same situation from the perspective of another agent, right? Generally, neurotypical children tend to pass the salient test around four, although there is quite controversial literature about this. Um, whereas this is relatively more problematic for autistic children. All right, there are many controversies about uh, um, the experimental evidence surrounding theory of mind, um, which is mainly based on ad hoc variations of well-established experimental paradigms. First, the idea that, that lab-bound false beliefs and perspective-taking tasks as these ones um, tend to be like, the, the, the setting tend to be quite uh, um, constant. Uh, trade judgments, social animations, judgments on photos or eyes, and other verbal material is quite a repetitive set of experiments that have been uh, carried out, uh, carried out um, uh, traditionally. There are conflicting results about whether theory of mind is based on simulation of full psychological theory, uh, theorizing mechanism. Um, there is like there is no agreement uh, upon whether uh, theory of mind emerges around age four or even uh, at earlier stages. There is there has been discussions about uh, differences between an implicit and explicit theory of mind, the way in the way in which theory of mind intersects with autism. It's also a matter of controversial debate. debate. In some cases, there is a straightforward connection between theory of mind, impeded theory of mind abilities. In some other cases, uh, executive functioning is also um, brought to the fore. Distinctions between behavior-based and mental state-based mechanisms of action monitoring has also been discussed. And uh, also the, 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 the issue, the very, the very setting of experimental labs is itself an inhibitor for addressing theory of mind, if you think about it, especially if we, if, we, if we consider this as a gradient phenomenon. Uh, if you think about this makes sense as the experimenter is unavoidably him uh, or herself another mind. So they are conscious individuals that uh, the children or, the, or even uh, the informants, even adults, if, is, um, that, if that's the case, uh, they need to take care of uh, and they need to be um, be taken into account as other minds as well. So 
these uh, these are things that cannot be controlled for and might be quite problematic uh, for the literature in this for this kind of literature. So it is agreed that new desiderata to, uh, desiderata to address, address theory of mind and cognitive psychology are needed. And in this book, I stress the importance of observing theory of mind as a mechanism that occurs spontaneously and not as resulting from a stimulus throughout interaction, intersecting with spatial and contextual condi conditions. Similarly, intersubjectivity uh, is a more um, popular notion in linguistics and uh, is also a matter of very controversial debate. It's being reinterpreted by many authors, addressing social spatial deixis, joint attention, intersubjectification uh, and face, uh, argumentation theory, evidentiality, interaction linguistics, metaspace grammars. There is a plethora of work addressing intersubjectivity in, in such a number of different ways, depending on the different definitions that are provided by different authors. The, issue, the problem that I posit in this book is that many of these controversies um, are often detached from the related notion that we have of theory of mind in cognitive psychology. So there is quite of a mismatch. There, is not, there, is, there has not been quite a, a systematic agenda or an attempt to find a, a solution between these two notions in these two fields. And as a result, intersubjectivity has been very rarely been designed to tackle applied research or other than merely uh, just a theoretical one. And in this book, I aim to exploit insights from both domains and to combine them in a framework that can inform research in linguistics, but also have an impact in first language acquisition, research in ASD, uh, autistic spectrum disorder, and also neighboring social sciences. And to do so, I try to establish this gradient approach to intersubjectivity, which is based on a set of assumptions and conclusions. The first is that theory of mind is communicated through overt intersubjective strategies and constructions linguistically. So um, this is not to say that theory of mind is not there if we don't express it linguistically. The, the, the idea is that as linguists, we are able to actually measure or uh, analyze different degrees of complexity of theory of mind through language when this is made overt, um, constructionally or uh, periphrastically. These constructions may vary in degrees of complexity and are evidence of the gradient nature of intersubjectivity in theory of mind. Intersubjectivity is therefore expressed linguistically, and this is a very important assumption of this book, as an extra proposition on surplus of meaning that is beyond the, the mere, mere semantics of what we are saying, the mere propositions, we feel the need to say something more, something that doesn't necessarily contribute to the proposition itself or what we are saying, but, um, uh, but is, it encodes our overt concern for the potential reactions of the addressee or any other social member uh, as a result of what we are saying. So we first say what we have to say, and then we use some linguistic devices to express our concern our care about how other people might react as a result of what we're saying. Um, these uh, intersubjective strategies are also additional to the perlocutionary effects of linguistic act. That is, when we, when we say something, when we perform a linguistic act, we have intentions, we have goals, right? But the intersubjective dimension is again redundant in that sense. If I want the milk, I could say milk, I want the milk, I want the salt, right? These are all quite straightforward ways to achieve what I want. But if I say, can I please have the salt? Or uh, would you mind pass me the salt? Or, uh, or even give me the fucking salt. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to, uh, to uh, underpin politeness. These are all extra propositional strategies and devices that do not diverge from my goal, that is to get the salt or the milk, and do not add any 
pr uh, proposition of semantic information to what I'm just saying, right? They are, ex they are distinctively addressee oriented or society oriented. They are something more. Again, they are an extra propositional surplus of meaning. Th there is third assumption, there is a unidirectional pathway of increased complexity of social cognition, which ranges from what I will be calling coactionality, which again simply underpins propositional meaning and reaching, reaching what we want, basic cooperation without any concern about other people's minds, to more complex immediate intersubjectivity, and finally extended intersubjectivity. This unidirectional pathway of increased complexity matches uh, the evolutionary shift that has been uh, proposed by Tomasello uh, in phylogeny and ontogeny uh, that shifts from dyadic to triadic to collective intentionality. And this decline of change of increasing complexity uh, can be found in language change and, both, and as well as in the, throughout the ontogenetic development of the child. So everyday neurotypical adult interaction, however, is not unidirectional, of course. So when we talk, we can make use of coactional, immediate intersubjective or extended intersubjective forms. Uh, it depends. Other assumption is that language change becomes then a fundamental indicator of tendency towards polysemies, where increasingly complex inter interactional function of intersubjectivity are at play. That is, if we look at a particular construction, you don't want, as we said before, or simply you, or apparently, or whatever you want, whatever construction you want, we will be seeing that this construction through time acquires new meanings, new polysemies. They stack above, above each other, right? And these polysemies very often tend to be increasingly intersubjective. And the, the, the further we go, uh, the more they shift from the awareness of just one mind, of one interlocutor, to the awareness of society as a whole, uh, as we'll be seeing. Or in other words, the shift from immediate to extended intersubjectivity. Finally, converging tendencies occur in cross-linguistically cross towards these sort of like increasingly social functions can inform experimental and applied research in cognitive psychology and pedagogy. So schematically, this, this is just what I just said. We have a continuum originating from coactionality. So I, I, um, I collaborate, I cooperate with my interlocutor just in order to achieve something that is beneficial for myself without any concern about the interlocutor's reaction to immediate intersubjectivity, when there is a concern about that single persona, to extended intersubjectivity, when there is a concern about that persona, as well as anyone else in my, within my social group. And this unidirectional tendency, I argue, is, um, is a tendency and not a law, uh, is valid in phylogeny, is valid in ontogeny, and is valid in language change. There is always, there will always be a, a shift from this state, this dimension to this dimension to finally this dimension. So let's let's see what do they mean one by one, and let's try to provide some examples to make this clear. So coactionality again is egocentric, right? Is present in any interested goal-oriented speech event involving at least two agents. So it's based on cooperation, but cooperation that is just beneficial to myself. It may be performed without overt linguistic constructions or strategies that are aimed at signaling the awareness of energies or emotions. Again, these otherwise would be the case of intersubjectively marked interaction. From an evolutionary perspective, these coactional ones are relatively simple forms of social interaction with individuals again, engaging uh, with their peers so much as they are using them as social tools to maximize their own gains. I used you linguistically in order to get what I want. So it's a case of uh, Steve, a, a two-year-old child uh, speaking with his mom, who his mother is saying, let's see this, and she's reaching for a shape box and holding it uh, up high 
and the child says, I want, I want, I want it. So the child is nothing by uttering a, a construction, I want it, uh, in order to get to this damn shape, shape box, right? And the mother, all right, uh, and she breaks the box down and gives it to Steve. Well, you have to take all the other things out first. That's what the mother says. You see, the mother uses intersubjective constructions uh, to mark her statement. She's an adult, uh, whereas the child is, uh, is not doing anything else other than propositionally expressing his wants. And uh, um, so like his goals correspond to the proposition itself. So coactionality is here schematically represented as a speaker writer engaging with an addressee or reader uh, via a proposition. And what is in, uh, in profile from the speaker writer perspective, perspective is just himself and the proposition. The addressee is just like a vehicle to get to the proposition, to get to the proposition, to, to realize the proposition. Bear in, bear in mind, this applies to any sort of proposition, even for representatives, even for assertions. It doesn't necessarily need to be an order. Um, so this is the case of coactionality again, which is, as we said, the beginning of this continuum. Then we get to a further stage of complexity, which is, again, a, a, indeed inter, in an underpiece intersubjectivity. In this case, we have the overt expressed on a surplus of meaning that is centered on a specific or generic addressee's potential reactions to what is said. The intersubjective surplus is additional to the proposition and meaning and the perlocutionary effects of the utterance, as we said. When we have I, I constructions, the speaker makes use of ad hoc linguistic forms of constructions to express his awareness of the addressee's mind and his or her potential reactions to what is being said. So different from what we said before, in this case, the addressee is also in profile and not just the speaker and the proposition. Consider this uh, sort of um, distinction between look the, the two usages of look. In this case, we have look used as a, a directive um, propositionally in its literal meaning. I'm just like directing your attention to something. Look, right? This will be coactional, a coactional meaning, right? There is nothing else other than the propositional and perlocutionary dimension corresponding to uh, the utterance. Whereas in this case, if I say, look, Danny, you don't know what you're speaking about. Look, Danny could indeed be omitted, uh, and the same propositional meaning will be expressed. This is a surplus of meaning. And this is because look, in this case, acquired a new polysemy, which is inherently intersubjective, uh, according to which I am preparing the addressee for a potentially phase threatening act, for something that might be potentially uh, hurting uh, Danny's feelings. And as a result, I, I try to express overtly uh, through language my concern of how Danny might react as a result of my utterance. It's like to say, Danny, I am aware of your emotions and um, epistemo epistemological um, uh, potential reactions to the utterance. And as a result, I want to sig overtly signal this to you. Um, Sim similarly, consider the construction here, to be honest. Again, even in this case, I would be saying something potentially displeasing to the addressee. You're not what I expected, right? Uh, this is a real example from the British National Corpus. Um, and with the chunk, to be honest, again, I am preemptively uh, preparing the addressee to hear something potentially displeasing. Bear in mind that intersubjectivity, as argued by myself, but pr before, prior to me by Downing, Traugott, and many others, shows a tendency to occur at sentence periphery, either right or left periphery in different languages of the world. Um, and that's because uh, we tend to have the propositional uh, meaning of the utterance at the center, at the core, or core of the utterance, whereby uh, intersubjective, um, um, surplus, 
surplus, let's use the uh, Latin plural of meaning, uh, tend to be encoded uh, uh, at the borders of the atoms. So as you can see here, I could, if I just said, you're not what I expected, that would be perfectly fine and perfectly grammatical. Simply put, that would, that would be uh, expressed at the coactional level. So the propositional meaning uh, would simply correspond uh, to, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the utterance, to the coaction. So there is not an overt intention, uh, an overt uh, strategy to account for, uh, linguistically account for the address uh, reader. So to be honest here, allows me to mark my, my awareness of the addressee's potential reactions, whereas without this chunk of language, uh, I just engage with the addressee uh, coactionally, not inter intersubjectively. Finally, the third stage of complexity is underpins EI, extending intersubjectivity. In this case, the speaker makes use of ad hoc linguistic strategies or perceptions to express his or her awareness of a third party or a generic social mind, and therefore how she expects anyone will react as a result of the proposition. So in this case, we have the speaker communicating with the addressee, and it's a proposition to the addressee. All of this is in profile, as well as a general third party. So the idea that what I'm communicating to the addressee uh, I'm expecting this to be not only valid and plausible, meaningful, sensible to him or herself, but also to anyone else in our social group. So we have again a shift from the awareness of just this guy, to the awareness of this guy plus anyone else. This is the stage where language becomes uh, a form of social recognition and we mark our linguistic acts as, as uh, utterances that will be recognized collectively. Uh, we expect anyone could some, somehow support and understand and, um, uh, and find sensible uh, and find what we are saying sensible and meaningful. So using the same construction as before, Consider this sentence again from the BNC, which occurs in a monologue. This long, well, uh, monologically, this long narrow format is ideal for this type of landscape. Well, for most landscapes, to be honest. As we can see here, we have the same construction that we were using to address a specific addressee. But now, the to be honest addresses not just a specific addressee, but what we expect anyone would. Re would would find sensible as a result of what we are saying. So, well, for most, more la most landscapes, to be honest, could be uttered in the presence of anyone. This could, be, this could be paraphrased as, to be honest to anyone who is listening or reading what am I uttering here uh, in this sentence. Uh, this, the shift from immediate to extended intersubjectivity uh, occurs semasiologically and diachronically from clearly uh, contexts of inherently dialogic interaction where there is a, a physical addressee present to uh, fictive interaction or monologic interaction or written interaction whereby we are addressing again a fictive uh, interlocutor as Esther Pasquale Pasqual would, uh, would agree upon. Uh, so in this case, we actually uh, process the potential uh, turn taking of a, a third party, a, a, an abstract uh, schematic social interlocutor. So ideally we will be saying something uh, along the line, this long narrow format is ideal for this type of landscape, at which point we, 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 we cognitively process a potential uh, turn taking by a third party, whatever a social persona saying, well, only for this type of landscape, and then we have an intersubjective marker well, together with the other intersubjective marker, to be honest, uh, ma uh, um, intervening on the proposition for most landscapes. So again, in this case, the speaker writer fictively addresses what she imagines 
to be a likely question from a generic third party in society and preemptively responds to that assumed turn taking. This kind of extending intersubjective polysemy of, to be honest, the same construction we said before, results and emerges out of originally immediate intersubjective constructs. So, diachronically, to be honest, first emerged as an immediate intersubjective construction, only addressing potential reactions of a specific persona, then through time, through conventionalization, entrenchment, uh, and, uh, and schematic change, the same function acquired a new, um, a new polysemy, a new semasiological uh, formation of meaning that again underpins collective recognition on behalf of the whole uh, society, or, or what I what I as a speaker imagine to be uh, the, the the generic social persona. So as you can see, what is really interesting here is that how language evolves semantically and pragmatically, uh, not necessarily formally, uh, but semasiologically, from lack of awareness of specific uh, sp uh, personas to the awareness of just one persona's mind to the awareness of society as a whole. And this is pretty cool because it really matches what has been argued in evolutionary theory about uh, joint intentionality and cooperation uh, among um, our nearest uh, uh, ancestors and greatest apes uh, and the, the ability of, uh, of cooperate uh, at early stages of uh, uh, philo phylogenetic development, but not being able to understand each other's minds and, and how like human evolution actually uh, was based on the ability to mentalize with one another. Uh, which is pretty interesting stuff if we then transpose this to the way to, to, to the semantic analysis of linguistic constructions and how these constructions are actually polysemous and varies, uh, vary in, in, um, in, in, uh, along a gradient continuum again from egocentric to social uh, construals um, of other minds. So again, um, uh, this, uh, this sort of like intersubjectification claim is true, is true for language change. Diachronically, uh, it is true um, evolutionarily, and is also true ontogenetically, so concerning the development of the child. So the ability to understand shared intentions first emerged between partners operating dyadically in acts of joint intentionality and then triadically including a common object of joint intentional attention, which in this case we simply refer to as a proposition. And then at later stages, uh, humans develop the, the capacity to interact with other individuals as members of a cultural social group in acts of collective intentionality. And this Klein is matched, as Tomazello argues, from a cognitive psychological perspective, also the uh, ontogenetic development of the child. And what he argues to be joint intentionality, ranging from one to three years old, then becoming collective intentionality from four to five years old, well, four years old onward. Interestingly, matches my model that is more uh, usage-based uh, oriented, more linguistic oriented, whereby we have a co exclusively coactional engagement uh, being at play from one up to two year old. Then we have intersubjective, immediate intersubjectivity uh, being at play around the third year of age of, age of the child. And then uh, ability of uh, to express and understand extending intersubjectivity is at play between the fourth and the fifth year of age. And in this book, I provide a number of case studies to show this. For instance, in Mandarin, uh, we have a sentence final particle called pa, uh, which uh, diachronically shifted from it's an ex again a surplus of meaning and shifted from the meaning of saying. Let's do this together 
to say, let's believe this together. From basically saying, uh, I want to, to, to engage in this action with you, interlocutor of mine, uh, and uh, I hope, preemptively hope that you will agree in this sort of cooperation to a more complex meaning, uh, underpinning extending it to subjectivity, having to do with, I am just making this assertion and I expect anyone in society to agree upon what I'm saying. So in this case, we have a shift from directive, uh, elocutionary force to assertive one. Uh, it imposes uh, in English, as I heard those women's uh, congratulatory words, he suddenly, suddenly blushed and said, leave, come on, what sort of congratulations are you offering? So here, pa marks leave, and I translated that as come on. So I could have simply said leave, as an order, but in this case, PA mitigates uh, the directive um, elocutionary force of, the, of this command and also expresses this as a shared joint project. In this other case, we have an extended intersubjective construal, and here we have like, Bangu so wei, xian yi, da gai shi shuo de xian yi lei, hui yi zi ba. We can say that uh, the so-called uh, pictographic meaning defined by Bangu can be considered roughly equivalent to the graphic blah, 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 blah. Okay, here we are simply making an, an, an assertion that is marked with, we can say that. And this we can say that is expressed again by this intersubjective particle pa, which again is not necessary for the propositional meaning of the utterance and is there, uh, simply to express the fact that I am, uh, that the speaker is expressing, uh, expecting anyone in society to agree upon what is being said. So we have this sort of extending the subjectification of PA from the meaning of saying, let's do B, let's do P, to a tag question function, P isn't it, to what I just argued, we can all agree upon P. Everyone in society can agree upon what I'm just saying. And this is a simple correspondence analysis, uh, whereby we have three different stages of time of collocates of pa in Mandarin, and we can see how the attraction between verbs of movement, such as walk, leave, go, come, to is, is stronger to a period, uh, to, to earlier periods of time, Whereas epistemic verbs, where we say, this must be the case, I consider this the case, this should be the case, this could possibly be the case. So meanings underpinning uh, representative speech acts, they are more attracted to the present, to modern times. So we have here really a shift from sort of immediate to extended intersubjectivity. And what is really cool is that uh, throughout the child's ontogeny, the same is at play. So we have um, here a, an interaction between the child and the mother. Neyang, Ta Ji Muna, Nani Pa Pa Ta Ta Chi Lai, Zai Wai Jai Ga Ba. So in this case, the child says, Zai Wai Jai, let's play again, let's play again with this. Now, come on, let's do this. With this pa, uh, the child could simply uh, express this, um, uh, this proposal as an imperative, but he, mit um, he mitigates this by adding pa at the end of the sentence. So overtly expressing immediate intersubjectivity at the, uh, around the age of two. And uh, uh, the child, uh, we can see that it is only around the age, age of four, I will show in the book, that the child is able to use pa with an assertive elocutionary force. So I think that's the tips house, come on. So uh, so I, he could say, I think that's the house thieves, simply as a bare assertion, but he uh, or she feels the need to 
add this surplus of meaning at the end of the sentence, expressing not just what he or she thinks the addressee might agree upon, but she, what she ex expects anyone in society might agree, might agree upon. So as we can see, the same shift that we observe diachronically in Mandarin for this pa construction occurs ontogenetically. And uh, this is the correspondence analysis. Again, this is a machine learning model that plots the attraction among uh, variables from very large data sets. And it compares children that range from zero to three year old and children that range from four to six year old. And we can see in green, that assertive locutionary forces are much closer to these age, age spans, whereas directives, uh, as we said before, um, are, are associated and attracted to children that are younger. So again, this indicates that extended intersubjectivity occurs around this period, whereas a stronger attraction between immediate intersubjectivity uh, is, um, uh, is at play, is at play here. And this again, this is okay, is, is the result of logistic regression showing the odds of uh, different types of locutionary force uh, occurring with, uh, with children uh, around the age of four, and four, six year old as compared to zero to three. And as we can see the odds for assertions and agreements, which are both of the assertive kind, especially assertions are far high, significantly higher than the probabilities to have directives which are in turn associated with younger uh, children. Um, another very brief case study before I get to the conclusions of this, uh, this presentation. It underpins the usage of such among children such in English is also an extended intersubjective construction because it expresses the meaning, uh, it's paraphrasable as the kind of, right? Uh, when we use such referentially, we're expressing when we say uh, the, um, there are no such things uh, in this hotel, uh, uh, what such uh, expresses there are no the, the kind of things that people would recognize as such. <laughs> so again, it really underpins um, what uh, uh, the, the speaker expects anyone in society would make sort of generic reference uh, to. Uh, and as we can see, like around, uh, uh, it is mainly around uh, age four that children become um, um, proficient and, and are able to use such as an extended intersubjective marker. So for instance, what, what, what do, why do they have such long nays? Uh, this child from the McQueen corpus, corpus uttered. And here we have actually three proposi propositions. It's like, I think the nays we are referring to are too long, a subjective in, meaning, I know that a genetic persona, a third party, would agree that those nays are too long, third party oriented, I expected the addressee to be aware of what I and I, uh, I and uh, um, the anyone in society will think, which is uh, it's essentially the same meaning as the genetic reference that we use with the kind of construction. So that's different. Maybe they, it was the kind of mud that sticks to you. So again, the child here construes this sort of like experiment, experiential meaning that he expects not just himself or herself, not just the addressee, but anyone else in society would have experienced at some point in their life. So again, I suspect the mud we are referring to is sticky. I know that a third party experienced something similar before in their life. Anyone in my society, I, I feel confident, would, be, would, would, would concur with what I'm saying. And I expect the addressee, the reader, to have experienced what I and the third party uh, did. Again, here we have the results of a behavioral profile analysis, similar to what was said before, a bit more complex, underpinning 
so many different uh, variables ranging from bases from lo to locutionary force and formal characteristics of a number of lexemes uh, across um, a process of first language acquisition where we compare where I compare the such with kind of that and uh, that these and vary so I wanted to look at such when it is used as intensifier compared with similar to with the function of berry this is such a beautiful house rather than such when it expressed deictically uh, uh, with the proposition proposition like function of reference comparable to kind of that and uh, um, more complex than uh, simpler does that and this and again we can see that like the attraction between such and kind of that which both, again, underpin extended intersubjectivity, uh, becomes stronger. Uh, uh, the, 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 the older the child, the stronger the attraction. So here they are very much further apart from one another. They become closer around four to six year old, and they almost overlap around age seven to nine. So again, here we have a very clear trajectory of extend an intersubjectification of the lexeme such uh, in first language acquisition. Finally, the last example of this presentation underpins uh, uh, autism. And uh, in my model, I argue that in, uh, across uh, uh, the autistic spectrum, there is a deficient ability to make use of intersubjective constructions as uh, extra proposition and surplus of meaning. And here, for instance, we have an, an interaction between uh, Brett and, uh, and his mother, and Brett, his seven year old. And as we can see here, all of uh, the child's utterances are ex uh, distinctively and inherently propositional. There is no intersubjective marker attached to them. So the mother here says, Well, First, let's talk about what you did this summer. So, well is intersubjective, uh, let's is intersubjective, all things that could be omitted propositionally by the mothers uses them in order to uh, account uh, overtly for, uh, the, uh, for her child's reaction to the utterance. Can you tell me? And the child says, what, the, uh, what, the, uh, what I did that summer, proposition. What kind, what kind, what things did you do this summer? Work. Is that all you did? All you did? No. What places did you go to this summer? You're not looking at me. Can you tell me first some of the places that you went to this summer? The pool. Well, you went to the pool, yeah. What did you do in the pool? Swim. Swam. Yeah, swam, yeah. So as we can see, all of the child's interaction here is, ex is merely coactional, occurs simply as a form of information-oriented cooperation with the mother, but there is nothing uh, from this excerpt that is employed to overtly account for how the mother might react as what he is saying, right? There is a perfect uh, um, intersection between proposition and meaning and, uh, and uh, utterances, nothing redundant, nothing more, nothing, in, uh, nothing that is a surplus intersubjectively. So I drew an intersubjective spectrum uh, that uh, uh, captures various, varying degrees of intersubjective um, concern that Smigel might want to express uh, to specific or genetic, generic interlocutors. And again, this, this spectrum could be used for the study of autistic speech. So first we have impaired coactional engagement, then we have um, communication is impaired, then we have coactional engagement, then more complex immediate intersubjectivity up to extended intersubjectivity, uh, expressing overt um, encoding of uh, um, social awareness. To conclude, um, in this book, which I very much hope you all will read, <laughs> I establish a gradient model of intersubjectivity that is centered on the individual's ability to markedly express a theory of mind throughout spontaneous conversation. 
This continuum ranges from uh, propositional interaction that is only aimed at achieving egocentric goals to more sophisticated skills that express extra propositional surplus of meaning, which can either be centered on a specific interlocutor to more uh, complex collective recognition of society as a whole. These intersubjective gradients thus ranges from mere coactionality, as we saw, to immediate intersubjectivity, to extended intersubjectivity, and there is this sort of uh, unidirectional tendency of linguistic forms to develop II meanings uh, out of coactional ones, uh, and then EI meanings out of immediate intersubjective ones. And this is, uh, is, is true for language change, and it's true for semasiological change, uh, uh, ontogenetic change, so first language acquisition. This gradient increase in complexity is also, uh, it's just what I said. Uh, I take the stance that this shift from schemas of immediate to extended intersubjectivity, intersubjectivity is ubiquitous at every stage of language change and in any world language. It's true, like for all languages in the world. I suggest that this model can also inform research in autistic uh, spectrum disorder. Uh, well, this uh, I think is all uh, for me today. So I will interrupt my um, my screen sharing. And I think I think I'm, I I think I made it within one hour as we uh, started ten minutes late due to some technical issue. So thank you very much for uh, for your time. I don't know, ah, yeah, I can see Diogo appearing. Okay, uh, Vittorio, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, precisely one hour. Uh, thank you for this very uh, interesting talk, transparent talk. Uh, we do have uh, some very nice questions here. Um, so uh, let's start from uh, with the question by Thiago Melo. Uh, so his question is the following. Uh, professor, you said that co-actionality may be performed uh, without a linguistic construction that signals the awareness of an interlocutor's emotions. Uh, but is in the absence of such linguistic constructions a way of marking that the speaker simply doesn't care about the interlocutor? Uh, wouldn't it also be a case of uh, immediate subjectivity. Uh, this is precisely the question that I was, uh, that I intended to ask. So if you allow me, I'll just add a personal uh, comment on this one. Uh, so what I was wondering uh, was whether we could actually talk about co-actionality for, for adults or for older children. Uh, and perhaps we could talk about co-actionality for to, uh, regarding very young children, uh, but was, I was wondering whether, um, actually I was thinking, maybe uh, when one acquires uh, intersubjective constructions, then one has uh, a number of constructions at one's disposal, then by choosing more or less consciously, choosing not to use uh, a certain intersubjective construction that has already been acquired, uh, that would uh, uh, be, uh, and, and choosing another one, such as a simple imperative, such as simply say choosing, uh, simply say uh, look, instead of using other different constructions, uh, ones perhaps uh, I'd say in the level of um, intersubjectivity rather than mere um, coactionality. Uh, so I was wondering if that would be the case. I think it's quite similar to Thiago's uh, question. Uh, I think this is, uh, by all means, the best questions that I could uh, expect uh, at the end of this talk. So, uh, uh, com uh, very well, very well asked from by both. I must say, it is the question that I would ask to myself at the end of this talk. Uh, in turn, I think, um, in the book, I I discuss this. Definitely, uh, there is there might be the flouting of a maximum of quantity, uh, and uh, we we say less to say more, right? And uh, that's that's uh, basic pragmatics, and that's that's what we do. Uh, we can generate uh, conversational implicatures by saying less, and that's definitely that will definitely underpin immediate intersubjectivity. Absolutely. Uh, 
Uh, however, um, the, the main aim of this book was uh, essentially um, first to, to, to define a model of analysis that could be applied uh, ontogenetically, uh, clinically, and of course also theoretically. Uh, what you just asked definitely needs, uh, needs to be uh, taken into account for theoretical research and by all means when, when there is uh, uh, ad hoc uh, omission of what would be conventionally um, and socially expected um, to, be, um, to, to, uh, to be there uh, as, as an intersubjective marker, of course, that is in turn intersubjective by all means. As you can imagine, this operationally is definitely harder to analyze, especially from a corpus-based perspective and uh, naturalistic, uh, by looking at naturalistic speech. Uh, this is not to say that there shouldn't be an agenda to do that. I, I absolutely think that that is an extremely interesting and fundamental element to look at. As we see, as we've seen uh, at the end of the day is that intersubjectivity, intersubjectivity varies at, at different degrees of complexity, of course. So we might have, uh, we do have in give dimensions where we are able to express, uh, uh, we are able to overtly mark something as a surplus by taking away something uh, from uh, something that should be there, right? Um, so again, uh, that would be a case of, um, that would be cases of marked form, forms of uh, of intersubjectivity, uh, by all means. So, uh, so I totally agree. And uh, there is indeed a section in the book where, where I discussed this, uh, where I, I made this specific methodological decision to look at intersubjective when people say more, uh, do more to express more, rather than when, do they, when they do less to express more, uh, which again would be definitely an one aspect where, where to further improve the, the model. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your answer, Tiago. That was the long answer. I believe the short answer is uh, read the book. So we're going to read the book. <laughs> uh, okay, I have more questions. Uh, I have another one by Moncla. Uh, I think the more theoretical one, I guess. Um, so uh, the language change studies that you have shown concerning intersubjectivity uh, process are associated to ontogeny. Do you believe intersubjectivity can also impact the language structure in adult language usage? Yeah, I believe this is the question. Yeah, definitely. Um, other very good question. Uh, one of the main um, methodological decisions that I made in the book and in general in my publications is to look at polysemy. So, uh, semasiological change and the stacking of new meanings. And that is because it makes things so much simpler and more uh, operational for linguistic ana for analysis, uh, both uh, ontogenetically and in language change. Uh, that, that, that is to say, if we want to look at whether children, when they grow up and they become older, are able to express more complex forms of intersubjectivity, if you look at the same form and their ability to ascribe new meanings that are increasingly complex to the same forms, well, that is very strong evidence to suggest their ontogenetic ability to, uh, to express collective recognition and social ascription to, to language, right? That being said, of course, intersubjectification occurs also constructionally. And, uh, and, uh, and, and formally, and there is, there is a body of work uh, um, on that, uh, that, uh, that has been like uh, provided by people such as uh, Traugott, um, I would say Desmet. Uh, um, there, is, there is a lot of research about uh, constructional change in combination with intersubjectification. So to answer your question, by all means, yes, there is also structural change uh, when uh, when intersubjectification is at play. Uh, in my uh, in my model, I I always like to look at uh, some sociological change, but it's not. Uh, uh, it it simply makes things so much more operational 
for this sort of uh, cross-domain approach to use the same model to look at language change, uh, first language acquisition, uh, cl clinical speech, um, and stuff like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, one more question um, uh, by Manuela Oliveira. Uh, she actually uh, quotes uh, uh, utterance or something that you used uh, during, your, during your talk. Uh, so she says, she asks, to what extent do you see in, in intersubjectivity in, in the sentence, in, in your uh, own utterance? Let's use the Latin plural. Uh, considering that this was a statement in which you alone make a decision, uh, so it's your own decision, I'm going to use the plural form, uh, as opposed to let's play uh, when the speaker uh, and the adversary engage in the activity. So when we, use, when we use the plural rather than use let's play, uh, I think I, I think the question is, is if I got it correctly, if I didn't, Manuela uh, may, may correct me in the chat. Uh, uh, she's comparing your own use of let's use the Latin plural uh, when in fact you are the only one who is going to use the form, the Latin plural, you are the, the one who is speaking, uh, as opposed to let's play, uh, meaning we are both going to play and that's an invitation. Uh, so yeah. She's asking. To what extent you see intersubjectivity in the first case as opposed to the second case? So the first case will be with the Latin plural. Would be your own uh, use of let's use uh, let's use the Latin plural. It's probably something you you said. I think that's how you phrased the sentence where you said supla, uh, and then you said let's use. Uh, but considering that you are the only one. Um, using any uh, linguistic form at that point, uh, she yeah. was asking to what extent you're seeing the subjectivity in this yeah. uh, okay. as well. I got it, I got it, I got it. Yeah, uh, that is precisely a case of extended intersubjectivity. So, uh, let's uh, is generally used, for instance, from uh, genitors uh, to children, uh, even when the children alone they need to make. Uh, um, uh, an action. So, for instance, let, or even from carers to all people. So, let's take our pills now, Johnny. I remember Elizabeth Traugott making this sort of example. Of course, the pills are just need to be taken by Johnny, and the carer will not take the pills. But this let's is used as surplus of meaning to, to, to convey this as a shared activity and to make this sort of like in, imperative statement or a directive. Uh, speech act uh, uh, sound more pleasant to the eyes of the addressee, so showing a concern. And again, when there is not a specific interlocutor there, uh, the let's again acquires in that turn an extended intersubjective uh, semantic component in the sense that uh, uh, it's not just me doing this and it's not just a specific persona that I try to establish this sort of cooperation with, but is anyone who would uh, come across what I'm writing or what I'm saying in front of speech, therefore expressing this, uh, this sort of extended uh, intersubjective construal, which in turn is more complex than one that would be uttered in the there and now where a specific persona is accounted for. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have at least two more questions. Uh, so next one by Marcia Machado. Uh, what do you systematically uh, consider or observe as variables in order to detect uh, intersubjectivity? I believe it's a more like an operation of one methodological one. Very, very good question. Uh, it's, it's really up to you. Uh, in that case, it depends on the operational criteria that you're looking at. Uh, in the case of such, uh, it's, it's actually a paper that I published in 2020, so I will need to go back and look at the, at the variables, but it will be like uh, um, clearly like generic reference, uh, um, the fact that uh, uh, they, they were contexts in which they are not contexts of play, they are contexts underpinning a certain degree of schematicity, so referring to concepts rather than toys and say like, I want that, uh, let's play with that chair, rather than say there are no such things as witches. Um, 
So of course, uh, a physical coaxial reference as opposed to uh, generic, more abstract reference uh, and so on and so forth. So there will be like a number, a number of criteria that will need to be used. In the case of PA, for instance, it will be again the case where uh, a, a, spe a specific linguistic act is uttered in the presence of a, an interlocutor inviting this person to do something together, uh, rather than context in which you make an assertion that you expect anyone would agree upon. So again, uh, if I say, when we say, come on, I could say, let's go to the pub, come on. And again, uh, that would be let's and come on as two constructions that I use a surplus of meaning in order to construe this joint project intersubjectively with my interlocutors. But I could also like be simply making my own presentation uh, now in front of all of you. And at some point I would be simply saying, uh, this is pretty clear, come on. And in that case, um, that will be a case of extending intersubjectivity and the very con nature of the context in which I use that construction I allows me to establish you as a fictive persona, as a third party, as generic interlocutor, uh, that uh, I would be expect to agree with what I'm saying. Um, so there are a number of criteria. Uh, in the book, you will see, the book is full of case studies. So uh, you will see different ways to try to address this sort of uh, shift. Okay, I have one more question, I think. I hope I, I didn't miss any. Um, it's actually quite difficult to manage uh, the chats and the, and the camera and everything. Uh, well, uh, Lilian Ferrari says, thank you for this very interesting talk. And then she, she asks a question. Um, the intersubjectivity spectrum uh, you propose is really insightful. And, and I'd like to ask if you think that each step in the climb could also be graded. Uh, definitely, yes. <laughs> uh, simply, we need to start from somewhere, uh, but uh, by all means, I'm pretty sure that there are different levels of intersubjective awareness and extended awareness, and the shift and like a progression from coactionality to immediate intersubjectivity. This is all for you guys to further explore and to further dig into. Uh, so yeah, my answer is yes. It's not is not that schematic uh, and definitely um, open to further inquiry and research. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Vittorio. Thank you very much, um, everyone, uh, for being here and for your questions. Uh, I think I think that's it. Uh, we have many people um, expressing their gratitude uh, for your talk and for your answers, but you can read everything in the chat. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Uh, okay, people keep uh, posting. I think there's comments, not really questions. So I think there's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, Wellington, I don't know what I'm supposed to do right now. So uh, if you could help me in case you are there. Should I simply 